what since the second half really how much they've really struggled Mind. set <laughs> Even if you are doing the same drills, you can just give individual targets to players. Yes. You know, okay. so then you're then you're engaging those individuals. You're saying, right, you lead this one, or right, I want you to have five passes off your left hand during this this next set. You know, or I want you to do a kick pass, or I want you to support the player on the outside shoulder this time. Right. You know, all those sort of individual tasks that you can get people potentially excited about. Um, to do that. Um, Welcome back to the next episode of the journey of a grassroots rugby coach. And today, as always, this episode is brought to you by Bull and Bear Crew. Bull and Bear Crew provide quality men's skincare products, and the range comes in hundred mil bottles, so you can take them when you travel. You can take them in your carry-on baggage. You can put them in your gym bag, your rugby bag. Wherever you need to take it, it's handy and can go with you. All the products come in that size. They're, all their bottles are reusable and refillable. All their products are natural. Check them out at bullandbearcrew.com.au. This week's guest is Gavin McLeod. Originally from Scotland, he's now living in London. He's currently the Fords coach at Hitcham Men's Team. He's also coaching Fernhill School. And he's also involved with the Saracens Player Development Program, which is a pathway for players aged under 15 and under 16. He began his coaching career whilst playing abroad in Canada as a way to give back to the club. During our conversation, we spoke about coaching fundamentals to kids, how we should always be learning and growing as coaches, how we help our players grow and learn, how to change coaching conditions to keep things fresh and exciting, and we spoke about his three error rule when looking at giving feedback to players. As always, if you like this episode, give it a thumbs up, give it a rating, pass it on to anybody else that you feel can benefit from it. Give us a review. That's how the algorithm works and it puts it out there for more people to listen to. So again, I thank you for supporting the show. Uh, sit back, relax and enjoy my chat with Gavin McLeod. This episode of The Journey of a Grassroots Rugby Coach is brought to you by Bull and Bear Crew. Bull and Bear Crew is a range of men's skincare products. There is face moisturizers, face mist, body wash, beard wash, shave oil, and moisturizer. They come in a 100 ml pack, aluminium bottles. So they're safe for traveling. You can use them check in for your baggage. Uh, they also come in larger at home bottles. All bottles are refillable, reusable, and recyclable. You can buy refill pouches to refill bottles you have at home if you don't want to purchase bottles from Bull and Bear Crew. Um, they've just been released. A great product, um, all natural, uh, all vegan, tested on men, not on animals, um, all that good stuff. Recyclable, reusable, and refillable. So you can use them over and over and over again. Go to their website, check them out, www.bullandbearcrew.com. Uh, place your order. At the moment, they're only shipping within Australia, um, but keep your ears and your eyes out to the website. Uh, they may be able to extend the shipping at some point in the future. Um, please enjoy this episode. Nobody can't find it. That's a mighty show. A mighty Mark Lester. Thanks, Gavin, for joining me. Um, just for the listeners who may not know who you are, First of all, who are you? Whereabouts are you at the moment? And what's your involvement with the grassroots game? Yeah, so I'm Gavin McLeod. Um, I am now currently just north of London, just half an hour out of London in the UK, originally from Scotland. Moved down two years ago um, to London for work and other stuff with my partner. And involvement in rugby now is I'm involved in the first 15 um club called Hitchin and with the forwards and the forwards coach with the senior team but also I'm involved with coaching the school team where I work at Fernhill and involved in some um, development player program pathway stuff with the under 15s and 16s which is sort of county rugby and um, which is affiliated with Saracens the, the professional entity and um, sort of community stuff so just just 
the lower level of the sort of pathway program to get in towards that academy professional rugby sort of side of things. So yeah, nice. Just over. <laughs> so busy like most of most of us are. Um, yeah. coach, coach more than one team. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. Um. So what got you into the into coaching in the first place, mate? Yeah. Um, so it was back in two thousand three. Me and one of my good mates, Mark, we went over to Canada and we played a season over in Canada. So that would have been our summer <clears throat> time, so off season. And we were just talking when we were over there. We were sort of keen to sort of give a bit back to the club and so forth like that. So when we came back to Scotland, um, we decided to just get involved in the, the mini and youth setup with our local club that we played at anyway. So just to really to give something back. So we were still playing, or I was still playing at the time, so we'd have been 23. Um and just wanted to get give someone back. So started under sevens initially with that and then just worked with that that group and worked with ages up through the years. So it was just mainly to give someone back to the club and then long of the short of it, it was a good way to get rid of a hangover on a Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> an excuse to go down to the pub on a Sunday after your Saturday game. Coach for an hour, give someone back and have a couple of pints with the boys after. Nice. <laughs> so it's a win win. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, mate. Get get the beer credits up during the day. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Nice. How did you find that um that transit? Because because you were still playing, how did you find that? Um like especially with the under sevens, um, because they're a different type of coaching. Yep. How'd you find that no, in that it's... first year? Really good. Challenging. Um, because it's still fairly young, like as a person, because I was only twenty three at the time. Yeah, so it's still a bit naive to a degree, but it, it was great because it was such a different age grade. Yeah, you know that I'm playing seniors rugby, but I'm actually just going down to teach the real fundamentals of rugby, like catch, pass, evasion, tackle technique. You know, yeah, just bringing the total fun element back into the to coaching and playing, and it sort of. Reminded me why you sort of play rugby as well. You're teaching these total basics with with under sevens, you know, just and just seeing a smile and joy you get, and then you're sort of times you go to a, a senior training on a wet Thursday night, and you're just standing about for ten minutes wondering why the heck you're doing it all. So it was it was a real sort of like um, contradiction at times, you know. Your senior rugby, it's quite serious and things, but then the transition on the Sundays to then the, um, just in the age grades. And just seeing a smile with the boys, and just seeing the parents come up, and then, then that youth grow. Just we started probably with about ten kids in my age grade, and we were just really starting that program off. And then probably when I finished it, it was just that age. It was probably twenty plus. Yeah, nice. You know, so then and then just the, the whole program just sort of took off from there. Um, we just sort of built it from the ground up like that way to sort of restart it again. Um, so it was. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And then, it, so, as I said, it just reinforces that you need the basics, no matter what, what level or age that you are. Yeah, and I think we forget that sometimes, that if you can't do the basics, you can't really move on. Um, yeah, and I see it a lot with coaches. They just try and push push players too far and they can't catch pass. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so over the nearly 20 years of coaching um, we've all we've all had heartbreak and disappointment um, <laughs> otherwise we wouldn't have we, we're not coaching to be fair um, what's some of the lessons you've learned from some of the like because you have heartbreak and disappointment and a lot of new coaches that's when they throw the toys out of the cot and they go no nah, <clears throat> you're too hard and they walk away but when you sit back the 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 guys that have been around a while, like they sit back and they go, "Yeah, that was pretty shitty, but what good can we take out of it, or what what did we learn from that?" Um, and the reason I ask that is just so, like for the young coaches, it's you're gonna have crap happen to you. Um, yep. So, and it's about bouncing back and learning from it. So, have you got any examples of some stuff that's happened that we have you've grown or learned from that situation that you could share with? Some new coaches? Yeah, so it's just sort of a couple of different examples, I suppose. But the first one, it's quite funny through what just 
going through the whole coaching journey when I was when I was younger and I was coaching the age grades, I didn't get as frustrated or upset with losses or disappointments as I do with senior rugby, which is it's, you could say it's a more sort of serious thing, but it's not. But but you know that at age grades or youth they're growing. Yeah. So you can't get too upset with them. Or I, I wasn't certainly. So for the first season that I coached when we went into youth rugby, so into secondary school, we only won one game the whole season. So it was then there was each game there was disappointments about performances and execution and so forth like that. But if you if you if you go hard at them, then you're just gonna lose them. So yeah. you need to sort of pick the positives out with it. And then I, I would always go home and still reflect anyway. And some of my best reflections are after tough losses and heavy losses. And I try not to get too emotional straight after the game, but sometimes it's difficult. But by the time you've had the Saturday night and the Sunday to truly reflect, you're just like, sometimes teams are better than you. Yeah, sometimes a bit of the game, and then you just put your hands up with that. But if if they're not, I challenge myself pretty hard about what could I have done differently, could I have done anything better, and other things like that. There's there's no one game that really stands out for me that's like a massive disappointment. There, there's a, there's accumulation or there's upsets where I've had where I've um, not continued on coaching at a, a certain place or a level and then that was a huge disappointment and in the time I was pretty upset just didn't understand why it happened but now, this was four years ago I think, two or four years ago now I look back at it and I was like well, maybe I just wasn't mature enough, maybe I wasn't experienced enough, maybe I just wasn't the right fit for that Bob in the direction they were wanting to go at that time, or so made peace with it now. Um, but at the time I was I was pretty furious about it. But these are all just sort of learning things. Like as you say, I've been coaching for just under twenty years now, and just how I am as a coach now is miles differently to what I am was back then. How am I as a coach now? I was different a month ago. Yeah. You know, like my yeah, oh, absolutely, I've just, yeah, yeah. You know, so there's 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 changes like that so quickly that you can just get a couple of light bulbs. And you're like, right, I'll try that differently, or well, actually, this team's at a different place or a different level than I taught them to be. Right, I'll just need to take a a step back and actually take my aspirations to the side for one second and and see if if they're content with that. So, yeah, so. <laughs> You can ask my missus, don't deal with disappointments too well, but I've, I've mellowed now more in my age. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's not everything, but it, it still does eat away with losses and disappointments. And that'll never change, and I don't think I want that to change. But yeah. I can get over it within 24 hours, whereas seven years ago I'd probably be filthy till probably Wednesday. Yeah. and that's a good <laughs> If I had a really bad loss. Yeah, and... I've been saying to our players, you're allowed to feel disappointed and, you know, like even when we, you know, we drop a player to the bench or the second grade, I said, mate, you're allowed to be pissed off. And because if, because if you're not, like, yeah, if, if you're not pissed off, you don't care, you know, but like you said, you just, you just got to have a, have a reflect on it and what can we improve? Can we improve anything on it? Were they just a better team than us on the day? Um, yeah. But yeah, just keep, and that was a good point you made. Like, even, um, you know, you're a different coach than what you were a month ago. Um, yeah, because we're constantly changing, you know? Yep. Um, it could be simple as simple as reading a book. You yeah. get a couple of slides from a book. Yeah. You know, or your opposition coach, how they how they interact, <laughs> or yeah. you want a sound bite on social media, or I was at Academy session for Saracens just on Monday past there. And just, just, just observing, but just watching how they coach, their speed, and how they just done live games. I just like, oh, that's a good little nugget. I'll take that back to the club. Yeah. Just from like organized to disorganized, just that simple little transition. Mm. So, oh, that's quite a good way to do a, 
a yeah. warm up or a game. Yeah, and that's it. And looking at those, <clears throat> like you said, putting it putting it away, not necessarily, you know, because I see a lot of coaches, and you've probably seen it too. They'll see something on YouTube and they'll go, "I'm going to do that training on Tuesday," yeah. and it's not the right place. It's not, but just put, lock it away and know when you're going to bring those things out. Yeah, yeah. and just and my my boys are always asking <clears throat> me, so what did you? What have you been reading? What have you been looking at this week or this month? Or, you know, because they know I'm going to come out with something that, you know, <laughs> like you said, you've, we've, I've seen so and so do this. We're going to run a variation of that. Or, you know, you see a play on the telly and you go, this is a ho- highlight. This is what, what we've been trying to do. And uh, yeah, just, yep. we're, we're all, we're, and we ask our players to improve every week. So, you know, we sh- we sh- as coaches, we should be trying to do the same every week as well. That's a good point, mate. Yeah, it's always good. To- That's the sort of struggles that you have as as a coach. You're always wanting to challenge your players and try and improve them. But when someone's working with your with your club or your your team, do you really need to try and change or improve it that much? Because you've seen this new move on a clip, and you're yeah. like, "Oh, let's try this." You know yeah. what I mean? You're just like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." yeah. As you say, Billy, just how do you adapt it for your level? And also, do you actually need to bring it in? I say at times. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I just I'll, watch all the game. Yeah. And the social media, and it says, oh, I saw this move. Can we try it? And you're just like, yeah, yeah that'd be good. But in the back of your head, you know, we've actually not got the skill set to do that or not at the moment. Yeah. So let's just lock that away, as you say. And we might, might try that for another day. But at the moment, we're good where we are. Let's try and finesse what we're currently doing. Yeah. But it's good that they challenge you and ask you that and they're watching, like, as you say, rugby players love watching rugby. Yeah. A lot yep. of sound bites, like little media tricks here and there, and they just love to see that. And that, and that's great, you know. So they're, if you're in a position that players are comfortable enough to come up and say, oh, I saw this move, what do you think of it? Do you think we could improve it? You're in a great position. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think that's good. That's that um that's those relationships that we build where the players are comfortable to say to you, hey Gavin, I saw this. What do you reckon? Do you reckon we could do something? Yeah. You know, because if and then you can go, yeah, look, I, I've I've seen that. I don't think it'll work because of this, this, and this. Or let's give it a whatever. But if they're coming to you with that stuff, like you said, they're watching, they're trying to improve themselves. And sometimes you gotta let them do it and fail. Yeah. So that then they go, oh, but we want to get, you know, or let's let's play that in the second half of the year so we can refine it and, you know, do all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. So, Over you know, here, as you say, like, conditions are so different now in, in the Northern Hemisphere. So I don't know if you get it where you are in Australia, but now we're getting to winter. We've just totally, last two or three weeks, we've really adjusted ourselves to senior rugby to just, just mauling now. Mm. which I know is not the most exciting thing to watch. But we got three tries last weekend from it. We got a couple of tries Saturday past, and then it's only until probably February, March time again that we'll, we'll put that back away in a locker and we'll start getting more expansive. So you have to be aware of the time of year when you're trying to introduce something in as well. Yeah, yeah. It's probably not as bad as that over here. I know in <laughs> in, in Melbourne we can get some horrible weather, but nothing, nothing that bad. Um, and like the boys in Sydney and Brisbane, they'd be, they get cold, but you know, they'd be able to play expansive footy most of the year. Or I would think, um, yeah. And that's the point too, mate is, you know, can we play that? A, do, do we have the skill set? B, it's going to be snowing on the weekend. We can't, there's no way we can do that. You know, I've well, not had that yet, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. And mate, watching it's a game, coming, watching eighty minutes of mauling, I could do that all weekend. To be fair, oh, I just, I, I quite like the like, mauling's great, and you can get really, really technical with it. But I'm still not, I'm not sold to like that's a way to play rugby. <laughs> yeah, like I'm, I know my bowlers coach, and I love it, but. Oh, if we scored six malls, I would be like, "Oh, come on, give the backs a shot." You know, let's let's have a bit more fun. So it, it's it's a great asset to have, but just just at the level that we're at as well, just don't want to go on a bit. But when you have referees that are so inconsistent, 
you just you're just sometimes inviting yeah. poor decisions. Yeah, you constantly. Break, yeah, ball tight, or if you've got slow ruck play, and you you know things like that. So it's like, how do you paint better pictures for a referee? Well, show the ball more. Yeah, you know, don't allow, don't allow defenses to sort of give them an opportunity to to do something maybe that's not quite correct, and then that gives them an option to get an exit. Things like that. So, Mullen's great. Don't get me wrong, I love it. I love it from line out plays. You know trying to play line outs but we're now just developing plays off the mall as well yeah. so when the mall's got it so far rather than just trying to get that secondary shove right what can we do someone exciting out the backs with that when they're actually on the back foot so it's got a lot of options which and this is the fun part of coaching yeah absolutely <laughs> you know, yeah when you've, got, when you've got your nuts and bolts sort of down and you're like right what can I get my blindside winger to do what angle can I get my centre to come in at yeah. You know what? What angle can the nine run off the mall? You know how? What? What can where? Where? Where can we run? Can we do a kick pass? Can we hit the seam? You yeah. know, or do we just fuck up the middle and then just go another phase again and sort of things like that? So these are the stages that you get quite excited about when you don't actually have to spend half an hour building up the mall mm. every Thursday night. That yeah. at the stage now they've built them all right. How do we strike off that? Yeah. And do we strike as we're going forward? So there, so the defense is on the back foot, you know, all the time. Yeah. Like you said, where do we want? Where do I want my blind side winger, and where do I want my open side winger? <laughs> you know, like if we're more in here, what do I want my open side winger to be doing? And yeah, it's it's so yeah done properly. It can be a good launch. Yeah, really good. As I say, especially with the weather, it's starting with. It's not heavy. It's just sticky underfoot over here now. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. just that's just like if you've got a good kicking game, you can just afford to go and then just other teams are just like, oh, not another line that we've got to defend, and then all of a sudden you play it off the top or, or something. But yes, yeah, so it's just getting a bit sticky at the moment. It's, it's not it's not miserable, but it is December now, so yeah, you have to change your sort of point of attack to degree, but you still want to try and play with the right spirit and and trying to get the ball out to the the fast boys as early as you can. Yeah. So now that you're in December and, and it's getting cold and horrible, um, <laughs> what do you what do you do at your training sessions to make to ensure that a the players keep turning up and b they're not standing around in the cold doing nothing? Um, because as we know, if they're standing around cold doing nothing, they're gonna look, they're gonna look for something else to do, and that's usually annoying the bloke thing. Next to yeah. So just try and get, just try and change it quite often. Um, so you're not doing the same repetitive tasks and, yep. and drills and stuff like that. Not having them standing about, trying to have them as active as possible. Condition games are huge for me. Yeah. You know, so they're getting much touches on the ball, especially cold, and then just change the conditions. You know, ask the players what they're sort of seeing to it, what they're liking. Even if you are doing the same drills, you can just give individual targets to players. Yes. You know, okay. Then you're then you're engaging those individuals. You're saying, right, you lead this one, or right, I want you to have five passes off your left hand during this this next set. You know, or I want you to do a kick pass, or I want you to support the player on the outside shoulder this time. But you know, all those sort of individual tasks that you can get people potentially excited about um, to do that. And then just also just like for instance this week we are now coaching at uh Astro Turf on Thursday night, hopefully. Um so just changing with the training even simple thing like changing a training venue. Players will be like, Oh, it's somewhere different. Yeah. You know, so subconsciously like, right, it's gonna be a different session. It's probably gonna be the same kind of session, but it's in a different environment. So when it's cold like we, we put training feeds on once a month as well. And like obviously with seniors, so we try and promote Thursday night beers a little bit. So you can get if you get off field right as well, you can kind of sell the miserable evenings a bit easier when you give them a little carrot at the end. Yeah, oh, <laughs> I know that's... that's not really rugby, but no, I, need I, I, the community I, sort of stage. Mate, I, I think it's a big part of rugby because the the way yeah. I look, the way I look at it is, you know. A lot of the lot of the boys in in the team that I coach, in my senior team I coach, 
they're you know they they're road workers or they're working in construction, so they're you know physical yeah. work all day, and they come to train and and you know it's a, they can let off a bit of steam, and if you can give them a feed and a couple of beers, they go home happy, and then they like you said, then they come back. Um, so sometimes it's that outlet for the players as well. You know they've had they got a shit boss, and they just come in, and they let their frustrations out. And they get to sit around and have a beer and a feed with their mates before they go home, you know. So well, I think it's a big a big part of, especially the community game, is that after training stuff. Yeah, and just, just getting <clears> that engaged <throat> with it. Like, um, and then with it being the community as well, it's how do you try and engage the community or the, the rugby community as well? Like, So I do... I'm doing a skill session with under 16s. It was meant to be this Thursday, but it's now next Thursday. But uh, extending an invitation to the 16s just on Saturday past to come and just shadow the coaches if they want, just to see what senior rugby is like. So they were in the sheds at half time, seeing what messages we were delivering to the players, how the players reacted, you know, and, and things like that. And then they had the game on Sunday, so some of the seniors went down. So it's just getting that engagement as well and that familiarity, familiarity. Yep. With them all, and then get some engaged. So then, when you come to training tomorrow night, you'll hopefully have the players just talking about Saturday or oh, 16s game was quite good. On Sunday, it was good sort of seeing the youth coming through, and then you can just have a couple of micro conversations with the players about about different things that you don't usually have. And then it's just a different way to engage and then hopefully get them excited a bit. But yeah, it's through the winter once it's not it's not easy. So as a coach, you do need to think, how do I get the best out of this session? And quite mm -hmm. often when it's cold, it's you just we just have to condense it. Just make it a good, quick, sharp hour of high intensity. Keep the chat to the real minimum. Um so you're sort of walking and talking more than sort of like having your 30 second minute conversations. Yeah, because that is kind of the time where they are getting cold when you're standing about it for a bit, so they can go and get a juice, and you can be talking to them while they're getting their water. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's because usually our sessions last for about seventy-five, eighty minutes, so it's not we don't go in for too long. But just during the winter months, we've got lights; it's a good thing. But it's just condensing it to get as much, but not drip feeding as much technical detail. Yeah, at this stage. Yeah, nice. I like it. Mixing it up. Did you do anything differently? <clears throat> um, just yeah, see so our the club I coach at. Our home ground is part of the Grand Prix track. Oh, so, makes... <laughs> so we we lose our home ground for about six or eight weeks at the start of the season. So um, previous years, they've tried to find other grounds and yeah, it just, it just doesn't work because you're training. Last year we trained on a, a venue that had no lights and it was at a school. So it was basically the 22 metre area was the size of the, the, the paddock we had. And had holes in it. We just so we could train for like half an hour, and then it got dark. We went, nah, this is rubbish." So our junior, the, our junior clubs on the other side of town. So we we actually went over there, and all the, the boys weren't happy that we were going over there because they got to go over the, you know, over the bridge across the traffic and all this. And then they got there, and now junior grounds got two beautiful fields, big change rooms, kitchen showers, and they've just gone. Holy shit! Like, and now it's like, oh, when are we going back there again? And then, like the the my prime example, the the junior committee went, oh, can we put a feed on for the boys on Thursday night? <laughs> so then, the, our yeah. boys were in having, so they they did stuff for the juniors, and then like cooked a feed for the junior players on the Thursday night. So they hung around and watched us train, and then some of them hung around. Some of the older boys hung around and had a chat to the senior players was also good for the junior coaches they were watching what yeah. we were doing and chatting to us and so that that was a good that was that, that was a good environment um yeah we 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 try and change it a little bit every now and again if we're a bit some nights we'll just have no 
like have a low impact night or a high intensity night or <clears throat> you know just just sort of depends too you just got to get the feel of the group where we are in the season um injury how many injured players have we got you know there's a whole but yeah like I said just just changing one session every now and again is, is enough to keep them keep them energized yeah that is because we um one of the clubs in Scotland that uh, coach Stuart Melville they um when we had a good season, we were, we were going to be promoted, but then COVID <clears> kicked in, unfortunately. Yeah. We actively, when the weather was rubbish, we just found somewhere to always train. You yeah. know, even if it was like a five-a-side pitch or AstroTurf or something. And that changes engagement and motivation. And I think a lot of the reason why we were successful is we were always training Tuesday, Thursday night, rather than just the acceptance of, oh, well, our pitches are waterlogged at the usual place, right? We're not training tonight or whatever. Yeah. So I think keeping that engagement, changing that engagement somehow, whatever way you do it, stimulates the boys, I think. And then it could really create quite a positive environment because you're not, you don't need to be on a rugby field to be doing rugby. <laughs> yeah. You know, all we need sometimes, like as a forward, all we need is a big bit of tarmac or someone we can do line outs. Yeah, how high is the oh. ceiling? Can we lift guys? Yep. Can we lift light guys yep. that don't hit the roof? Yeah. You know, I was at a gym once and the, um, the Italian national team were training. They were doing line-outs on a tennis court. Yeah. You know, they're just not bothered. As long as you've got a decent bit of space to yeah. throw a ball, you know, so you can, you can find. But it's like, don't get me wrong, it's not ideal, but players are adaptable. We want We want our players to be adaptable on the pitch, so why can't we challenge them to be adaptable with training even mm. if it is just a training environment so we want them to sort of be able to combat as much as possible so throw these little challenges by however we change your training it does keep them stimulated even although if they, they probably don't appreciate or understand what we're, we're trying to do half the time yeah. <laughs> yeah, thinking that we're all mad Why why the heck are we doing this and that and there's Often method in the madness, but we don't we don't disclose the madness. <laughs> no, not oh my guys know I do some weird and wonderful stuff, but that's okay. They 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 see it coming and they just roll their eyes and they go, Yeah, we're just gonna do it because we know there's a method, there's a reason why we're doing it, and it'll be clear in about three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a couple of sleepless nights later on, they'll be like, Yeah, yeah uh, got that one. Got yeah. that one. <laughs> yeah. So remember when we did that exercise three weeks ago? This is oh yeah, now we got it. Yeah. No, but that you're right, mate. Just changing things, making them think, um, and sometimes like condensing a space down can actually benefit even your catch pass because you you know you're in a shorter yep. space and less time and and all that type of stuff. As long as like I said, as long as it's a safe area where you know you, your players aren't going to get injured. Um, no, that, that's yep. some good advice, mate. Um, yeah, we don't sort of have as, those dramas as much here, but. Um, <laughs> okay. So what's what's the quickest uh, lap one of your boys has done around the circuit then? Running, <laughs> mate. Believe you're not allowed to done it, Matt, Oh, we we wouldn't have we wouldn't send our boys around it because um, it's it's actually a um a gazetted road, so there's cars on it and everything, so. Ah, um, uh, right. Yeah, so at, at night we're really has sort of in that where it's getting a bit dark. It's like, yeah, we don't want to be taken up, and it's it's a forty kilometer an hour zone as well. So you got it's basically walking pace. So if you've got thirty or forty guys running along the road, you're just going to piss people off. Yeah, yeah. Which is not. And you got your club colours on. Yeah, <laughs> they know who, they know who we are, mate. You know, like, it's like yeah, not a good look. Um, so, but anyway. We we make do with what we've got, and that and that's and that's the thing about coaching is that it's just making making do with the resources we've got sometimes around yeah. um, conditions and fields and players and um, you know stuff yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. So when you when you're having those sessions where it might be a little bit different or you're doing a new skill. Or, whatever and you've got to give some feedback to your players um especially when you try and have those little short sharp sessions um and i know there's 
a heap of different ways to give feedback. And the way I received feedback when I first started playing doesn't exist anymore, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> but what's um, what's your sort of method for giving feedback to the players when, when you're trying to keep them moving and getting through those short sessions? Yeah, just... It depends on the individual and the feel of the group and, and everything. Yeah. There's, there's so many moving parts to that that it's it's never one fits all. But I think I learned a few years ago and really helped me with the feedback is the sort of the three error rule. Like when I was starting as a coach, as soon as someone done an error, I'd be like, what's going on here? Could have been as simple as just the pass wasn't right. You know, his hands weren't in the right position. He slipped or whatever. But then you'd be like, right, why aren't we passing well? So now I kind of wait for that three the three errors, and then I'll be like, right, is it is it the drill they're not understanding it? Is it certain individuals that aren't getting it? Is it the way I've explained it? Multiple sort of reasons. So you've got to look at the whole environment and just take a step back for 30 seconds rather than just 10 seconds. Like, right, we're not getting it. What's going on here? So... That was a really good learning for me, the three error rule. And as I say, it depends. If it's the same individual that's making errors, just pull them aside, just have a conversation. They might have not had a good day or they yeah. might not understand it. So so why do you want to stop the whole drill for an individual and then expose that individual to the group? You know, yeah. so yeah. but then if it's multiple errors for multiple reasons, then you just kind of want to or I want to sort of stop it for 10, 15 seconds, get some feedback, ask why they're not getting it, or if it's obvious why they're not getting it, just, just reinforce your sort of your learning points with it. And then probably what I've started to do is, is change it slightly as well. If there's been so many errors, see that, as you say, condense the space or make the space bigger, make the passes shorter or longer, less or more numbers. For 10 or 20 seconds, maybe a bit longer, until they get it, then bring back the original scenario again. Yeah. It's just about building up confidence and then putting that challenge or pressure back into the environment. Yeah. But any new drill or any new skill, there's always going to be errors anyway. If they're not, you're not challenging them. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah absolutely. So if yeah. you're like, right, I've got this new drill and they're nailing it, you're like, why are they nailing it? I'm not, not putting enough pressure upon it. You know, it's just so that there has to be an element of an error count for a new drill or a new skill. If it's something as simple as lateral passing and all you're doing is a five meter pass with no pressure, then you would question that quite quickly why they're not executing yeah. it. But if it's a lateral pass where you're actually wanting two lines are running and it's all to be completed within a five meter space, that's quite a bit of pressure. So then you then take a backward step. Why are they not? There are errors in within that. You know, the running lines might not be correct. The ball carrier might not be taken out, might not be square. You know, the execution of the pass might not be correct. You know, so there's a multitude of things with that. Yeah. So you take a step back to that and saying, right, there's errors there. I might let them play out for a bit longer, see if the players can rectify it themselves first as well. Because if it's a new drill, you're... You want to explain it, but you also want players to actually put their hands up and go, right, this is what we should be doing and getting them to lead it a little bit. But yeah. sometimes they don't, and that's fine. So it's just just different scenarios for each one, to be honest, Billy. So over my years, I've learned, I've learned that. And when I first started on, I think I probably thought, this is how I want to coach. This is I just like... You have this utopia moment, utopia moment, and you're thinking, right? I want us to get there, but you don't get there overnight. Yeah, and I think <laughs> you know it takes a lot of steps. Yeah, and I think, and I know I was bad, for, not bad for a place to do it, but when you first start coaching, you get that drill that you know that catch pass and that the cat that it's humming and they're not dropping it and they're moving at pace and you're going, yeah, this is great because it looks really good, but like you said, you're not challenging them. But as a young coach, we sort of go, I need it, all my practices to be perfect. And uh, you yeah. know what I mean? And and the, as you get more experience, you go, no, I, I want them to make errors. I want them to drop the ball. I want them to throw that forward pass because yeah. it's actually helping me make them better because they're, you know, they're leaving too early or 
you know, like you said, they're not yeah, they're not square, whatever, whatever the situation is. But when it's humming and it's a perfect that perfect drill, they're not getting anything out of it. It's just stroking your ego. That's all it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, this looks good, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't have to do any coaching here. Yeah, but, <laughs> but they don't play against cones on the weekend, or you know, there's actually people yeah. running at them on the weekend. Yeah, yeah. No, you that's... want your you want all your errors on your sort of Tuesday night and the beginning of Thursday yeah. night, and then you want it. You want your perfection that last 15, 20 minutes on a Thursday night where it's yeah. error free. Yeah, you know, or as close to error free as you can get. Yeah, but that's only ten percent of the training week. <laughs> yeah, and even in those situations, for me, it's like, okay, they've they've knocked the ball on. What do they do now? Because you find a lot of young coaches, as soon as the ball goes around, they blow the whistle. Yeah, and the, play, and the players yeah. just stop, so they don't, you know, like and then on a Saturday, if the referee doesn't see it or something, they all stop and yeah. and you know, so it's like it's getting in that you keep playing until I blow that whistle, you know, just and I yeah I. They hate it when I referee because I cheat when I referee at training and miss yeah, stuff. Yeah, we all do. We all do you know that. what I mean? I, oh, I didn't see that or, you know, yeah, he had his yeah, hands yeah. on it, but get used to it, you know, all that type of stuff. So my boys know now they don't they don't complain. They just play it. So Yeah, do all that as well and they get frustrated and then they get, they get a referee just as good as me yeah, on a then, Saturday. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Every, you need to realise, even in professionals, every referee is different. Yeah, they reference it differently, so we need to expose our players to adapt and adjust mm. to every session and environment. What, what's the conditions? What's the parameters? What's the coach or the referee seeing? What's he's allowing us to do? What's he not allowing us to do? Right? How can I take that to our advantage? Yeah, like some of the best things when we do condition games, all I'll say is right. All there is is three conditions. Ball carrier has to go down, one over, defender has to drop off. That's the only conditions I'm given. And then sometimes it'll take about five or six minutes before someone puts a kick in. Yeah. You know, and then they'll be like, oh, are we allowed to kick? And I was like, well, my only three conditions were what I've just said to you, so I've not said you can't kick, you yeah. know. And yeah. it's just sort of exposing players to like, right, these are your conditions or parameters, play within them. Yeah. And find, find a way to get a better, better, best outcome. Yeah. Yeah, and I often find, uh, or, or they'll do the opposite straight away. They'll go, can I kick? And you go, yeah, if you want to. And then and then they don't kick. They just they just want to know that they can, but they never do it. So, yeah. Or they overkick and you're like, right, another yeah. condition you can't kick. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can kick when it's on, you know. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, that, and, and that's the skill as well, mate, is just being able to change those parameters as a coach. Yeah. Um, no, that's that's some good advice there, mate. Love it. Love it. Um, coach development. So, what do you? What are some of the things you do around coach development? Because we've all got the educational side. Where you, you know you go and you sit in the classroom and you get your, your one, two, three, four, yeah. all your levels. But it's that coach development um, that makes us better coaches. Um, probably a more rounded coach what's some of the stuff you do um and you'd recommend for some young coaches or any coach to be able to yeah so <clears throat> cpd is obviously always always good and like the last the last thing i've done which is how i met you is that a uh, crusaders coaching leadership program yeah. which is just an online program just reached out for that that was a phenomenal two-week quite quite intense course if you're working full time, so that was just learned so much from that. COVID, bizarrely, was actually quite a good way to learn because so many pro coaches done master classes yeah. or zooms or so that knowledge bank and is now stored electronically as well or yeah. in the ether up in the sky. That in terms of coach, there was nothing like that when I started. You know, so yeah. there's so much out there in social media now, and you just need to tap into your rugby union. Like Scotland's actually, I, I get a lot, I'm not tapped into the English rugby union like that, but they've just launched a roadshow in Scotland about their key principles and stuff. So they've had Gregor Townsend, Steve Tandy, Leicester coach, and a couple of other boys, and they're all online now. 
Mm. And it's it's just a really good tool to have to sort of see common themes, trends, what's the terminology they're sort of using, things like that. So that's great. I'm also one. I don't read enough, but on holiday I love I love reading books, and I just I'm just like biographies and other things. So just the generic ones, sort of Eddie Jones, Richie McCaw, Dan Carter, Lawrence Lawrence Delalio. And um, John Kerr's legacy, as well. All these books, they've all got great little sound bites on them. Just these one or two sentences about, oh right, I can use that. Understand that how that works now. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't really read when I was when I was younger like that. It's probably in the last ten years, I would say. That I've read books and reading about coaches, and the thing it's it's, it's funny, the thing you read about books, each coach is so different. Yeah, and each player as well it's so different. Like the difference between Dan Carter and Richie McCaw, the two probably the best players you could argue. But how they promote themselves, how they adapt, how they conduct their lives is mm. nearly polar opposing, or yeah. how they approach a game. Yeah, you know. But when they came onto the field, they were they were near enough identical, if you know what I mean, because mm. of the passion, the desire, the skill rate, the execution. Everything like that, but off the field are two totally different characters, or certainly from when you read the books. And coaches are the same. Yeah. They're probably a lot of them have got very similar ways of the how they want to play, but how they how they go through that through their philosophies, beliefs, core values differ probably not hugely, but they still differ. Mm. Yeah. You know, and that's <clears throat> one thing I would say as a young coach, just just go and research. There's there's no right or wrong way. There's just your way. Yeah. You know, and you're never it. gonna get it overnight. You're never gonna get it overnight. I don't get it overnight. I'm still learning. Like I've I've learned probably more in that leadership program and that two week intense one than I probably have in the last two years mm. collectively. Just that intenseness. But I've learned stuff over the last couple of years, but that bit and then just watching as I say, it was a, a, an academy session last week. I watched how they went from um, structured to unstructured. So I picked up a little nugget from that that I can easily relate to a game that you've got an unstructured condition game. If you score a try, you start off with a structured line out or scrum play next. So you're so there's there's always just you just need to be open to learn and don't be scared to challenge in the right way. Question. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I've probably done that when, enough when I was younger as well because if you're young and naive, you just probably this was in the early noughties or early noughts. So you're you're sort of looking up to coaches at times and worried to ask them about certain things. But yeah, don't yeah, we, yeah. Just, we want to share, we want to share, <laughs> yeah. you know, we have ways that we want to do things, and a lot of people won't agree with it, but. I believe what I'm doing, so I'm happy with what I'm doing. So question it. If I can change it, I'll change it if I think it's for the better. So Yeah. Yeah, there's as I say, there's so much sorry, it's a long winded answer, Billy. But no, 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 it's just it's... COVID's been great in terms of learning. Yeah. Not hands on, I have to say. But in terms of the volume of content, there is some rubbish out there, don't get me wrong. Mm. You know, so I I would have that one caveat. Watch who's delivering the coaching. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. there is so much out there. Yeah. You know, and from elite coaches now as well, that they are openly sharing their knowledge, which 10 years ago, even five years ago, they weren't sharing openly. Yeah. yeah. I would say personally, certainly in the Northern Hemisphere, that's what, what I, I've noticed. I don't know about what you're getting in from Australia Rugby Union or, or from your regions. Yeah, we were pretty much the same down here. Um, we had, mate, it used to be horrible down here. It was, this is this is mine, no one else can have it. And I think COVID sort of broke yep. that down. Like you said, you know, you'll get emails from Rugby Australia saying, so-and-so is doing a, um, a webinar on this, you know, yep. and, and um, you know, and they, they did it really well here because they did um, – well, they had Jeff Parling and a few few of the forwards coaches, oh, yeah. and and all they did was lineouts. So, like, if that's what you want to do, guys, we just logging into it, you know. Um, yeah. Or 
before a scrum session, you know, and there was all these, and then there was other stuff, like you said, and there were good coaches out there that were probably out of <clears> work. <throat> so they were doing, oh, I'm doing a webinar, 10 bucks a head, you know, and so you get 10 bucks, yep. mate. I'd, I'd, I'd pay a hundred bucks to, to have a one on one with you. So I'll, I'll pay you 10 bucks or yeah. whatever it was, you know. Yeah. And like you said, then most of them send you the recording of it anyway. So you've got that and yeah, yeah, it's just, uh -huh. it just really opened up the, the whole coaching network, I think. And what, what it showed to me was that most coaches, whether they're, you know, guys like us or, you know, the next level or international coaches, if you very rarely they'll say no. Yep. And, and if but if they do, they'll go, Oh, look, I can't because I've got this, this, and this. Yeah. But but talk to this guy, you know, tell this guy I told you to call. You know, like they're not they don't just fob you off. They'll they, you know, if they're busy, they're busy, and that right, understandable. But yeah, like you said, I've spoken to coaches and been in stuff with coaches, I'm just going, Oh yeah, like I never ever thought I'd be in a listener to this guy speak you know so yeah that's yeah it's been the same here mate just covid covid opened it up for everybody i think around that um uh, the zoom conferences and stuff that we never ever used to have so um, never uh, even heard of zoom before covid i oh, know right i'd love i'd love to have bought shares in it before covid um no and that's good and like and it was a good little bit there you said like you, you know you read those coaches books and they're all different and every coach yeah. I speak to is different um, because if we all coach the same, it'd be a boring game of footy. Yeah. You know? Because I um, I read Phil Jackson's book, 11 Rings, you know, the NBA. Oh, yeah. The Bulls. Yep. The yep. That was learned quite a lot from that book, actually, yeah. which is quite okay. funny. Like, one, I actually learned a tactical thing from basketball but I was like oh why, how can I could probably influence that or try and bring that into rugby because he had a big thing about the triangle you know you've always got two avenues open for a pass yeah. in basketball Yeah, I was like why can't we just use that same terminology in rugby because you're always wanting two options of passing yeah. aren't you Yeah. so why can't we attack in a triangle you know you've got the ball carrier and your triangle could just be one either side of you or it could be a front door or it could be a back door you know it could be someone closer, it could be a kick pass. But it's all angled into triangles. So I was like, it's just quite a nice, simple term to use during a few I've not introduced it yet, but I think you could say, right, are we attacking in triangles? And there's a lot of detail into that, but it's such a simple one liner to say that players would be no, we're not, we're only we're only we've only got one option off the ball. You know what? Yeah. So I really enjoyed that and also think from this, I read this before the uh, documentary came out, actually, or I was nearly finished it, so I didn't watch the uh, the last dance before, but just how we deal with Dennis Rodman. Yeah. I thought it was unreal. And, like, in terms of a leadership management, how to get the best out of your players, I just thought, I read Phil Jackson's book, and I was like, he's so laid back about this. Like, this guy that's going to Vegas, getting absolutely skated, you know, but then he'll put that he knows that he'll put three hours on an exercise bike on a Monday morning before training mm. to sweat it out. Yeah. And then have a good training session with the boys. So Jordan and others weren't actually that worried about Dennis Rodman. But you imagine now how many professional coaches would allow that for a rugby player saying, right, you're playing your Saturday and I won't see you till Monday morning. And he goes, they'll go 24 hours in the bevy. No yeah. rugby, no rugby coach would allow that, would they? Yeah, but Phil I, Jackson was so realistic about it. I heard a podcast that Eddie Jones did, and he was talking about George Smith, and he goes, "George yeah. Smith, George Smith liked to drink," and he said, "But I was never worried about George because he was always the first one at training, trained the hardest, and he was like, because they had that conversation around, mate. I know you like to have a drink, but as soon as your performance drops, and he goes, yeah. mate, he would he would train." He would out train everybody, even if he was hungover. He would out train everybody. But again, they they knew what he could do, and he was still putting the effort in. And he just liked to have a good time when he was away from the field. So, yeah, it's it's managing those players. But yeah, that was wild yeah. with Rodman. 
I, I saw some. I haven't seen the whole the whole series, but I saw those episodes on Rodman. I just went, "That's a that's a ballsy move, eh? That's a that's a career that's a career yep. definer. Because if he gets it wrong, he's gone." You know, but they just had so much trust in him, like the more. Yeah. It's, it's quite funny because basketball was sort of different because you only really can have one alpha male in that team. Mm. But they probably had maybe two and a half. Wouldn't say Pippen's quite the alpha male, but you had Rodman and Jordan. Mm. You know, both wanted to lead different in different ways. You know, but they both totally respected each other. So just. Just reading books like that, as I say, it doesn't need to be about rugby, but just seeing how coaches, I want to read an NFL one actually as well, but just seeing like Belichick's one. Yeah. There was another one, I can't remember what it was, but just seeing how these elite coaches, they're not across all sports, they're not actually hugely different. No, no. Just, it's just amazing just learning how individuals deal with professionals. And like the majority of us don't deal with professionals, but geez, we can take so much from it. Yeah. Like last couple of weeks, just from that leadership program, the Crusaders ones, always had conversation with players before. But I know just, you know how you usually on that before training session, the coaches get together in the training shed and spend about 20 minutes, half an hour, just talking together before everyone's warming up. And then we're like, oh, right, we'll go out. You know, coaches usually sort of do that together yeah. in their huddle. I try to sort of get out a bit earlier to sort of engage with players more. Yeah. You know, just the time before and just little things like that. Just And then allowing that sort of uncomfortable silence a little bit as well as a, how are you? And you can just gauge straight away rather than just sort of the walking past, how are you? Yeah, fine, right. Have a good session. Yeah. You know, now you're just like standing, stopping, how are you? You know, rather than in a passing way. Mm, mm. and just try to engage a bit more and sort of seeing how they are like a lot of the time they're fine but sometimes you can sort of tell that they're not quite right and it's, it's generally about work maybe just yep. have a shit day yeah. something yep. else but if you just engage and open up with them a little bit then geez you get I think you get a lot more from them after that as well yeah and it's not you're not cutting the many you're not doing you're not doing them any favours or cutting them any slack, no. but you're understanding why they're having an off session. You know, so you, yeah. might, you might give them a little bit that night, but it doesn't mean they get free reign every week. It's just, oh, you're having a, you know, you, yeah, you got a shit boss or you've had a fight with your missus or, you know, your mum's sick or yep. whatever, whatever it is, you know, like just, yeah. And the more you, the more you know about that stuff is... Yeah, so that's that's if, if you know they're having an off day, you just know those players you get more out of them. Yeah, so if they are having that off day, just if they if they are having those errors during a session, just pull them aside. That's when you have that one on one with them. Yeah, give them a little challenge, saying right, for the next five minutes, I just want you to sing your favorite song in your head when you're doing a session. Yeah, see how that I like it. You know, a and, silly little thing like that, get the mind it, off everything. Yeah, and I think it also gives. Once you've had that and you've got those relationships with your players, it also gives you that opportunity to go, you know what, boys, I'm a bit flat today. So the yeah. session might be a bit flat. Like I've got a bit, and, and they go, yeah, cool. No, like it's that two way yeah. street as well. Like, cause we, you know, we, we have shit days as coaches as well, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so, no, really good, mate. Um, one last question. I'll let you go. Cause I know you got to go to work. Um, okay. If you could get in a time machine and go back to 2003, what advice would you give yourself as a first-time coach, knowing what you know now? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably the main two is just enjoy the journey. Yeah, I was something that I heard from Eddie Jones one. I think it was I can't remember. I think it was Eddie Jones. Just enjoy the journey more. It's not going to happen overnight. So just enjoy the process and the journey and everything that's happening. And two is just. Ask questions. Yeah. Don't be scared to ask questions. You know, if I asked, if I prompted more questions, I think I probably would have developed a bit quicker. Not, I wouldn't have developed any higher, if you know what I mean, but I think I would have probably been mature as a coach a bit quicker. Mm -hmm. Because you go into coaching and think, you know, oh, geez, you know nothing. Like, 
I would hate to now look back and see what my first couple of training sessions like and how generic it probably was compared to how detailed you're trying to get a training session now. Yeah. But you thought, you know, it was a simple, like, right, I'm just going to do a passing drill. So all I'm happy, I'm happy if there's 20 passes without a drop, drop ball. Whereas now would be like, be really looking into that detail where their hands out are lay, you know, how are they passing the ball along their body? Where's their hands finishing? Mm. You know, where's their hips pointing? All yeah. these sort of things. But I was naive, not naive. I just didn't know then. So yeah, just ask questions. Young coaches, yeah. just just ask. No one's going to say no. And if they say no outright, then probably learn the lesson that they might not be the best person to ask if they're yeah. going to be so dismissive like that. If they don't give a reason why they can't at that time, maybe they're not wanting to share or what they can't share is going to add or what they can share is not going to maybe add much value to you. Yeah, I love it. So there's not going to be many of those, but just ask questions. Yeah. And ask questions of your players as well. Yeah. I think. But especially like even age grade and stuff, ask them. Get understanding. Because what they don't know what you know in your head as a coach. Mm. So ask questions and just enjoy the journey. Yeah, nice. I love it, mate. Love it. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Gavin. That's been awesome. Yeah, I've, got, thank you, I've, got, I've got some pages and notes here, so um, <laughs> I'm sure the uh, the listeners will get a few bits of gold out of what we've uh, spoken Fingers about. Fingers crossed. So, yeah, mate. And if, crossed. If, if, one, if every coach gets one thing out of it, well, happy days, you know. All right. Yep. No, no, that's great, Billy. Thanks right. for the invitation. Right, right. Thanks, mate. Gotcha. 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 Gotcha.